All right, I think I'll get started. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the USDA Midwest Collegiate Committee's second segment in our month of May Collegiate Webinar Series. Uh, my name is Tim and Corwin, uh, current chair of the USDA Midwest Collegiate Committee and the general manager at Western Racquet Club in Elm Grove, Wisconsin. I hope everyone joining the webinar is doing well, is healthy, and is excited to get back on the tennis courts as soon as possible. Throughout the webinar, if you have questions uh, for viewers who have questions for the coaches, please use the chat window. Uh, in the event that we don't get to your questions, we will post an FAQ afterwards through the Midwest office. There'll also be a link to this uh, webinar that the Midwest will have on the on the uh, Midwest website. Uh, we all have a passion for college tennis, and those of you planning to play college tennis can learn a ton from our five guests this afternoon. So we hope this segment on D2, D3, NAIA, and junior college tennis and recruiting during these times of uncertainty will be helpful. There are a lot of unknowns and more questions than answers right now as we look at the current college landscape with an eye to the fall of 2020 and into 2021. Today, we are pleased to welcome a diverse group from across the Midwest section, representing each of the small college divisions. Representing NCAA Division II from Ferris State University, head women's and men's coach, Mark Doran. Representing the NCAA Division III from Lake Forest College, head men's and women's coach Raquel Viscovi. Also repre representing the NCAA Division III from Case Western Reserve University, head coach, head men's coach Todd Wojcikowski. Representing the NAIA from Marion University, head women's coach Tyler Scanlon. And joining us this afternoon, representing the junior college division, Dr. Jim Love, head women's and men's coach from the College of Lake County. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm gonna to start with a question for Dr. Love and, and Juco. Uh, Jim, can you tell us the overall philosophy of your division of junior college and, and what makes your division special? And maybe as a, uh, uh, an, entry into that, just mention a little bit about your, your team and how long you've been the coach there and a bit about your background. I have coached at College of Lake County for uh, seven years. Uh, previously, I've been a full-time tennis pro. I've been a high school tennis coach uh, and a summertime tennis pro, a full-time school administrator. So I've done lots of things. Uh, but uh, this is my seventh year at College of Lake County. I think the, the philosophy of community colleges is it's a great opportunity for player, players or students to get a, a great education at an optimal price. Uh, we obviously allow students of all abilities to enter, and that's a great opportunity. But at the same time, we also have great opportunities for students who are excellent in their abilities and their ability to move on to four-year schools. I think as a tennis uh, area, we are trying to give kids an opportunity to play tennis after high school, and we have a lot of players who can do that. I know at my school, we have a no-cut policy. Everyone who wants to be on the team can be on the team. And then for many of them, they can go on and play at four-year schools. Perfect. Thank you, Jim. We welcome from NAIA, Tyler Scanlon. Yep. Hey, so, yeah, it's my uh, – I'm just finishing up my third year at Marion University. Before that, I coached uh, high school tennis as well. And then I also work for NJTL of Indianapolis. Um, I think the NAI, the really nice thing and a little bit different than the NCAA schools is, especially on our recruiting, we're a little less strict on when I can talk to student athletes. Um, and that way you're able to get to meet them a little bit before um, when you're out at tournaments and everything. Thank you, Tyler. That will probably dive in a little bit more on, on your recruiting philosophy and maybe some more details on what that might look like for NAIA. I'll turn the mic over to Raquel Viscovi. Welcome, Coach, from Lake Forest College. 
Well, first of all, thanks for having us here. I appreciated the opportunity to, you know, talk to you guys. Uh, this is actually going to be my fifth year at Lake Forest, so I'm really excited going to my fifth year. Um, it, Lake Forest is Division Three. It's a private liberal arts school, so it's a small school. I think the the great opportunity that students have to go to Division Three is uh, the opportunity that they get to go to um, do things academically. They are able to do a lot of clubs. Um, the you know really focusing their academics more much more about the experience that the students get whenever they come to Division Three. The opportunity they have to have internships while they are in college. I actually coach at most levels. I coach NAIA, Division One, Division Two. I play Division One, and I didn't get the experience of having an internship whenever I was in college. Um, so I think that is a very valuable thing for Division Three. Um, so I think it's all about the experience that the students have, and it's um, the, the commitment uh, level is a little bit different. Um, so I think it's 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 great to play Division Three for sure. Yeah, thank you very much, Coach. Uh, Todd, in terms of, uh, uh, we're glad to have you on the committee or on the committee and uh, also representing um, the Midwest section and all your volunteer capacity, Todd. So we appreciate you being on the, on the panel as well. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and uh, any color you'd like to add on the D3 uh, spectrum to add to what Coach Raquel mentioned. Yeah, uh, I, I thought uh, what she said was great. I mean, Division Three, it really is truly a great balance between the academics and the tennis for these uh, student athletes. It's the biggest division uh, across, um, you know, all five. Uh, there's a lot of teams in Division Three and opportunities to play. Um, so, you know, my, my career started at Toledo, and then I transferred to Ohio State. I finished my career at Ohio State, and then I went to the Citadel, where I was a graduate assistant. So I've kind of seen, um, you know, mid-major Division One. I've seen BCS level Division One, um, and now I'm uh, I'm at Case Western, which is a high academic school. Uh, one thing that I, I'm very proud of and that I, I value greatly about um, being at Case is is my role as faculty. And I think uh, right now in in these times of, of you know uncertainty, I I very much am, am happy to have a role as a faculty member at at our institution, um, which which puts us in touch with with many more than just the the student athletes on our team, but all the students that are across campus. So I feel blessed to be able to know five thousand extremely extremely smart um, students, you know, every single day uh, as, as I'm you know at at Case Western. Fantastic. Thank you, Coach. And now I'll turn it over to Coach Mark Doran uh, from Ferris State and to tell us a little bit about yourself and NCAA Division II. Well, thank you for having me. A little bit about myself. Uh, I this just finished my second year here at Ferris. Um, before that, I was a tennis in, professional instructor for 15 years, uh, two years in the Chicago area, four in the Fort Lauderdale area, and then another 11 here in, in the Michigan area, and then uh, came back uh, to my alma mater at Ferris. A uh, little bit of philosophy at Division II. Uh, we kind of take pride in, in kind of being, you know, kind of what Todd said, but that even balance between the academics and, and athletics. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, sitting at home might think that Division I is a little more towards athletics, Division Three academics, and I feel like we sit kind of in that pocket right in the middle. Uh, but then everyone has a little bit of, you know, each coach is a little different. Uh, at, at Ferris and especially on my team, we're, we're, we're very athletic or academic based. So, you know, it, it goes a little both ways, but I think uh, it's a nice little pocket in between. Awesome. Thank you guys. Great answers. I'm going to turn it a little bit more personal and start with you, Mark, and work our way back down. Uh, during these kind of tricky times and unsettling times, uh, what advice have you given your players and how much contact have you had with them? Like, what, uh, what, what have you been able to share with them during these last couple months? Yeah, I mean, basically, it's been just kind of trying to just be in their ear a little bit and make sure that they know that uh, someone's still caring about them, even though they, we, we don't see them every day. Uh, you know, basically been trying to you know, keep them focused and trying to explain to them that now, you know, staying at home and all this time, 
it can easy to be distracted. And uh, trying to encourage them to try to maintain some type of schedule, uh, no matter you know what, how much different it is than their normal schedule. We're really trying to stay on top of that. Uh, I mean, we do t weekly team meetings via Zoom. Uh, mostly it's a lot of fun games, just trying to get to see each other. Uh, and then I have players all over the country and all over the world. Uh, so, you know, trying to just keep that, you know, positive, you know, mentality is basically what we've been focused on. All right. Thank you, Coach. Todd, same question. Just curious um, and, and others kind of thinking about what you might say. To what extent have your players been able to train? Um, what, I mean, are you guys still in session at Case? And what does the summer maybe look like for your players? What kind of advice are you providing? Yeah, so uh, just like with uh, Mark's team, we're doing weekly Zoom meeting on Tuesday night. We do a we do a documentary review. So our guys watch the documentary over the weekend, and uh, and on Tuesday we give give them a couple minutes to talk about it, what they thought. Um, and it's it's been tough for them to fit in because it's been finals, and they just finished finals. Uh, one thing that's happened in a lot of universities is they've kind of cut summer. Um, you know, people aren't allowed on campus in the summer. So that meant that all the summer classes went virtual. So I will say that almost every single player on my team is taking a summer class now. So they almost have six to nine credit hours that they're taking. So they finished finals last week. And then this week, they're taking summer classes. They're trying to maybe get their credits ahead. What does that mean? Um, you know, maybe they finished their undergrad early. And since the NCAA granted them this extra, uh, extra year of eligibility, Maybe now they can springboard into a master's program earlier because um, they're using this time where they're not as, you know, not able to do as much to, to get further ahead on their schoolwork. Um, so that's something I've noticed that's been happening with, uh, with us. Um, so, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, to Raquel, to the extent that, uh, can you share with the viewers, like, what the extra year of eligibility is like and is that for d1 2 and 3 uh i'm also curious about that extra eligibility as it pertains to naia and juco so yeah. uh, go ahead thank you yeah no i think that's that's going to be great for our student athletes to have that opportunity like todd said um they are at a lot of universities are doing that incentive that they can take online classes right now i mean for instance our incoming freshmen they are able to take online classes right now so they can get ahead of their undergraduate program and potentially getting a master's degree after that so they are going to be able to to play another year i already have guys in my team that were freshmen this year already asking for that the the fifth year potentially um so i think this is a great opportunity i think you know i think that they deserve that year our season was cut short halfway so especially for men's tennis um i think that's going to be a great opportunity and i i mean i definitely have students in my team that are looking forward to that opportunity so i think it's going to be really fair nice thank you coach Tyler, how how is the uh, how are the rules different in terms of NAI and NCAA with regards to that eligibility? Is that something that the NAI is also extended? Yeah, so they're also getting an extra year added on as well as the NCAA. So I think the big thing for my players will probably, I mean, the majority of them I think will graduate on time, but maybe looking to take advantage of that, maybe even at another school where they do offer a master's program, I think that that could be a huge uh, help to them if they want to continue on in their education. Marion doesn't offer a master's in business, which is what the majority of my players um, are majoring in. So I think they could take advantage of that. And I think the big thing that we kind of focused on at the end of the year was to finish strong with uh, grades as grades is a huge part that can help us in the NAI for my scholarships. So it kind of, so it's kind of trying to stick on them about finishing the school year strong and getting them any help they needed for the online classes. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, and, and Todd and Raquel also mentioned that, uh, that whole grad school component. So just for the viewers, if, if you have a, you can, maybe you have an, you get an extra year of eligibility, you could start a master's program and, 
at a maybe a different school and still compete for another year um, or stay at the school you, that you're at. So Coach Jim Love, what how would that necessarily apply at a JUCO? Same same fundamentals that they could play another year if they, they wanted to? Yes, it's a little bit different for the women. At least that's my understanding because our women actually have their main season in the fall. So I actually made myself a note, right? My assumption has been on our players have been that for the women, they've actually completed their two years. So uh, the women it wouldn't apply to, but we were going to probably have our strongest men's team ever since I've been here coaching. And uh, some of the players are thinking about coming back. Uh, one of the things I've done during this time uh, of being, as soon as being off is one, we've ac emphasized academics as being the most important thing, but also give them a time to look forward and say, what are their plans after this year? Are they looking to move on to four-year schools? What are they doing? So some of our players are thinking if it fits with their academics, and that's the most important thing, that they may come back and play. So I'd say I may have some who come back and do it. It would be good for them and for us. That's nice. Jim, I'm going to stay with you as we kind of move into the recruiting uh, philosophy uh, part of the, the webinar. Um, can you describe what recruiting is like for you and how it may be – different now during this time of COVID-19? Uh, actually, th this spring has given me some extra time to do some recruiting that I would not have been able to do if I had been coaching a team. Although obviously the big disadvantage is that I have not been able to go out and look at high school senior players because they haven't played. Uh, but our philosophy, you know, we're fortunate enough that we can take any number of students. So we encourage everyone to come to College of Lake County and play tennis. Uh, my goal is to go out and try to attract the very best players that we can, talking to them about the, the advantages of community college tennis, the fact that they're going to be able to play. It's going to be a, a cost advantage to them. That's going to be the less expensive way to get college credits. And also, we do have some tennis scholarships that we can offer to them. So if we think someone is uh, going to definitely come in and improve our program, I can offer that ahead of time. If not, they still have an opportunity to compete for those scholarships once they arrive on campus. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Tyler, how about you in terms of uh, your recruiting philosophy and, and how you're recruiting right now? Yeah, so unfortunately, I wasn't able to go out to the uh, high school matches with them being canceled and everything. So kind of just been in the emails, pretty much emailing players and uh, you know, looking for responses and then trying to set up, you know, a Zoom call or a FaceTime with the players to see if they would be a fit and then um, see if we can look to set them up for a visit coming in the fall if we're able to um, get people on campus and everything. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the tools that, that you would, like, you know, use? Uh, do you yeah, so um, UTR, videos, UTR, that kind of thing. Yeah, UTR is a huge tool that I'm sure everybody probably uses. Um, and you're looking to see, not necessarily if you're beating everybody, but are you competitive with them? Does it look like are you putting games on against better players? Um, and then also tennis recruiting, as that's where I can get their uh, contact information. So. If um, you're a player, you should make sure you're up to date on there. And the main form of, it, of communication I'm going to start with is an email. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Coach Raquel, I'll turn that the same question to you in terms of your uh, recruiting philosophy, recruiting for both genders. Um, any advice that you would give prospective student athletes um, right now? Like what's the best? way for them to get noticed? I mean, I still, uh, obviously they're not able to play any tournaments right now. So it's definitely difficult. And we, we all know that, that this is happening. So it's happening for everyone. So I feel like a lot of students right now in high school, they're freaking out and there is no reason to because it's, everybody's in the same boat. Uh, but I think one of the things that I always liked, even with UTR, I obviously we looked at UTR, but I'm a video kind of a person too. I, I love looking at the videos and, you know, if people can find a wall and they can hit against the wall and, you know, show a video against the wall if they don't have an ability to play with somebody. 
Uh, I think that's great. I think that's a good idea, but, you know, just expressing interest and, you know, having a, I guess, a resume ready and talk about your, a, a little bit about yourself, emailing. Um, so I think that's the way to do it. I think sticking to the videos right now, I think it's probably the best bet. Thank you, coach. So Todd, you mentioned in a prior, uh, committee meeting that we had maybe last Friday or the Friday before um, about the, the tricky time we're in right now where players are committing or even paying a deposit and then pulling out um, because there are a lot of options that are opening up. Can you speak to that a little bit and also speak to how from a strategy standpoint you you attack that or react to it yeah so um you know that that question about recruiting even tied in with the last question i'm going to try to you know bridge those and, and find some parallels uh quickly here so you know i did just kind of finish watching that the webinar that tim russell did and from the ita and you know i was surprised to hear so he he said that when the nca granted that extra year it caused a lot of waves. And one of those waves was the recruiting wave in that I, I saw one person put a question in the box about what do we do about recruits that are juniors now that maybe thought they had an offer, we're going to a program that had a spot and maybe now that spot's not available. Um, you know, I, I look at it through, through my own lens in my experience in 2008, when I finished my MBA, um, you know, we were in a recession and I look at what's happening now and I'm just seeing this thing happen exactly as it happened to me. And I thought, well, thank God I had tennis because tennis is what, you know, gave me a career opportunity when our economy was bad. So I'll, I'll say we had a graduating senior that went to his company, a very, a, one of the big four and, and asked, can I defer my offer a year and go back to grad school, earn more credit hours so I can sit the CPA exam. And I also spoke to a couple of executives at the big four and I thought, this seems smart, right? I mean, businesses are on hold, consulting is on hold. It seems smart that maybe some, some people could delay entering the workforce and use that extra year. Okay, so I think I, I view the positive. I see, well, you know, it, it's good that they can go to grad school because now they, they can better position themselves for the workforce when we come out of this. Um, and as it pertains to recruiting, you know, sure, I mean, now that's one last starting spot that was open. Okay, granted, but, um, you know, I mean, nothing's going to be perfect. I'm continuing right now, just like Raquel said, I'm glad she referenced video. It's amazing to me. If I, if I sent a message to 50 recruits today and asked them, hey, do you have any video on your phone? Just simple, you know, like just prop it up in the corner. Show me some workouts you're doing. Like 10 have it. Like, it's not that hard. Just put your phone in the corner shoot a little video, you know, just if you're able to get on a court or whatever, it's just something to show. This is what I'm doing. I'm working on this. I'm working on that. Um, so do, do it from your phone, shoot it as a message. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And, um, you know, I guess in final, you referenced, you know, what's happening with, with recruiting as far as, you know, kind of jumping, maybe you were committed here. Um, I think the big news came when, um, you know, I'll reference tennisrecruiting.net, to be honest with you. They do a great job putting out articles that update you on every NCAA change that happens. Um, Rian and Paki, she does an amazing job of covering that. And some of the bans have been lifted as far as like what you can do technology-wise with recruiting. You can, you can have players on your team or, ex or people from the university sit in on a call with a recruit. Um, so I think there are a lot of things that you could be doing to fill this time to, to communicate with the recruits. Um, just to get them the proper information and make them feel at ease about the, you know, the university that they're going to. That's awesome. Really thorough. Thank you, Coach Todd. Mark, what's the, what's the recruiting landscape like for you right now? What are your philosophies and, you know, what are you focused on in terms of your roster um, and any advice that you would give to prospective student athletes? that might be different from what you've heard already? Yeah, no, definitely. That's what I'd love to talk a little more about the philosophy and the goals, just so that, you know, those listening kind of understand, you know, what we're working with as coaches. Uh, you know, and a lot of them, you know, might not understand that 
from team to team, and especially in Division II, uh, you know, not every team has the same amount of scholarships. Uh, there are teams in my conference that literally have one full ride scholarship on the men's side and, you know, a, a handful that have four and a half full rides. So, you know, our philosophy has to come in, how can we get the players that we feel right for our team, but that can also still afford to go to school uh, and be a right fit. So I would say one of my largest, you know, philosophies is, is the academic side. Uh, trying to find someone that has that balance of great grades so they can bring in the academic scholarships that our school offers and then match that with some good athletic scholarships. Uh, you know, for example, I, I, have, I have a gentleman coming in from Sweden that has a 1400 on his SAT and then is also an 11.5 UTR. So for me, that's the pot at the end of the rainbow. I mean, it's fantastic because he's gonna get a very, very large academic scholarship and then I can give him an athletic scholarship that doesn't hurt the rest of my team for being able to recruit. Uh, so I would say that, uh, you know, academics plays a huge role. Uh, as far as the tools go, you know, obviously I use UTR, tense recruiting, and video like the other one said are very important to me. I watch a lot of video. Uh, I really think it's, it's a great way for those that you can't reach out. You know, I do have a lot of international players on my team that you can't see in person. Uh, it's just not in the budget to travel to Germany every other month. Uh, so video is fantastic. And then, you know, just a cool thing for me is here at Ferris, we have a, you know, I was talking to Tim and earlier about it is uh, we have a program called professional tennis management uh, where there's 40 students at our school that are studying to become tennis coaches, tennis pros, work in the industry, but they have to watch video. So I have students in my office every day watching video with me. And it's awesome because I have another set of eyes. I have 30, 40 more set of eyes watching video. And it's, it's a lot of fun. And I, you know, I highly suggest that, uh, you know, like Todd said, have video available. Uh, and, and live ball hitting is huge. I want to see how you are hitting the ball, uh, not just from a fed ball. I want to see you hitting and playing points. So, uh, so yeah, I, I would say that that's kind of, you know, where I sit there. Uh, you know, and I think this transitions into, you know, the next question, which a lot of you've already touched on is, you know, you know how it's impact recruiting for the future. Um, it, it's tough because usually May is, is for me is when I really, you know, hit the ground running. Uh, but it's funny how many people are on here that also, you know, have one of their teams in the fall and one of the spring in division two, that's pretty rare. Uh, I think we might be the only conference in the country that does that. But because that my fall is extremely busy. So I don't have a lot of time to recruit in the fall. Uh, so springtime and summer is huge. And so this is having a very large impact on, on us. Yeah. Thank you, Mark, for sharing that. One of the questions I think is relevant from the Q and a, just to what extent do, uh, do you guys use recruiting services? Um, now that, uh, you can't see the kids play. Um, this is a scout with the NSR. Um, so Mark, why don't you, just mention that and, and as I lob the next question your your way guys just uh, you know mention I guess whether you use recruiting services or not um, there's some really good questions in the in the pipeline here so I'd, I'd like to try to get to them but to what extent do you use recruiting services yeah I would say I definitely use them uh, you know you start to create relationships with the different you know agents and recruiters uh, and and obviously since you know, 50% of my team are international students. So it's, it's crucial for us. Um, I don't think it, you know, within the United States is I use it as much, uh, but I definitely use it. You know, it's, it's a great resource and it, it's a, it's just another help for any student athlete that's looking, you know, for more help and finding where they should go. Awesome. Todd, any, uh, any experience with recruiting services? Of course, yeah. No, I think we're we're very heavy, heavy based on a, a healthy diet of tennisscreen.net, universal tennis ratings, the UTR website, um, the USTA website. Um, I think they're all important, important pieces to this, you know, tennis world that we live in. I think they they all are incredible. As far as recruiting services, um, if I did have advice for scouts, I would just say if, if you could just see our inboxes, I'm sure Tyler, Jim, Raquel could speak, I could speak for them, but I don't want to, but 
we get emails a lot from so many automated recruiting services. I, I really would love a phone call or a personal email that's, that's addressed directly to me. Um, because many of the times that we get an automated email, I mean, it, it's, I'm a head men's coach. I was the women's coach four years ago, but I, I, I half the time I'm getting, you know, contacted about a female recruit and, and I'm not so sure that the, that the service or the agent has the right button clicked or the right filter. I mean, we live in a world of, you know, relationships. So I would just encourage to build that relationship by personally reaching out. Thank you, Todd. Hey, Tyler, there's a question. I, I'm skipping over a question, but I'll try to get back to it because mm -hmm. it's interesting in regards to budgets. Uh, what do you want to see in a video and how long should it be? Um, I think it's a I'm, really relevant question. I'm definitely looking for match play. That's, that's the main thing I'm looking to see. What are you doing during the match play? I don't really want to see fed balls hit to you because that's not going to happen. That's not going to help us really win matches if we're going to, if you're going to be in my lineup. So I think, you know, anywhere from five to 10 minutes of just match play is useful enough for me. Um, if it's longer, that's fine for sure. If you want to put a whole match, that's awesome. Um, but that's really what I'm looking for is match play. Thank you, Tyler. Um, I'm actually just going to deviate for a second and grab this, this question, which might apply a little bit more towards D2 and NAIA. The question is, curious how budgets work for international versus out of state versus in state. If a state school has a full scholarship available, is that based on an in-state tuition or out of state? In other words, is there a financial advantage recruiting in state? So do you wanna just grab that Tyler and then I'll ask Mark and then we can get back to our outline. Yeah, so for us, um, we're a private school. So the tuition is the same across the board for all three of those, um, whether you're in state, out of state or international. Um, and then as far as the scholarships work and NAI, um, if you have a certain above a 3.6 cumulative GPA, um, none of that money goes against the pot of money I'm allowed to give. So that's where the big focus for us in having uh, students with good GPAs um, coming to the school and to continue with getting that high GPA. So that helps us with uh, scholarships. And as far as like full scholarships, I would say not that many teams and then NAI necessarily give full rides. I would say the majority of them are having them pay at least a little bit of something. Thank you, Tyler. Mark, are you, is Ferris uh, public? Yes, we are. Yeah, so with Ferris, you know, obviously the scholarships, the athletic scholarships are based on in-state tuition. What's really cool is a couple of years ago, Ferris went to in-state tuition for everybody in the United States. So we don't have an in-state or out-of-state. And then we also reached out and anyone from Canada also gets in-state tuition at Ferris. But then it is different. For an international student, it does run close to probably about another $10,000 on top of the typical you know, cost for a, you know, in-state tuition. Thanks, Mark. Is it your experience just looking at the D2 landscape that that would be <coughs> the rules might be different depending on what state you're from? And yeah, it's it's very different. I mean, obviously, at least we have private schools also that, you know, like Tyler, that have, you know, one one price, but uh, every state's a little bit different. Okay. All right. Thank you. My gosh, the I feel like the questions that are coming in are better than the questions that I prepared for you guys. Um, yeah, Raquel, just a quick note on uh, Jim Chapman's question. What do you want to see in a video? How long should it be? Uh, well, we asked, we had answered uh, that one. Uh, then there was a question that popped up. Do you want to see an entire match with picking up balls and all that? Um, I think I know the answer, but I'll let you give it. <laughs> sure. I mean, live ball hitting is probably the best. It's something that we want to see. I mean, I don't mind seeing a little bit of cross court points are the best, I would say. Uh, but I don't mind seeing some cross court, uh, cross court rallies and serves and all that. But I think one thing that I definitely don't want to see, and I, I get videos like that a lot, is 
whenever somebody's feeding that person and I don't even see where the ball is hitting. Uh, you know, what, where the ball is landing on the core on the other side. So I'm just seeing the mechanics of her forehands, backhand serves and whatnot, but I don't even see where the ball is going. So I, that's a little frustrating. Uh, but I think somebody said in the questions, do you, do you want to see me running after to pick up balls? No, that's not, that, that's not necessary. We, we want to see live ball hitting the most, I think. So. Thank you, Raquel. Uh, Coach Jim, I'm going to, um, since you, you've been in the coaching field in a number of different capacities uh, for several years, um, and this is probably a good question for anybody who wants to pipe in, but I'll start with Dr. Jim. What would you recommend to individuals who are trying to enter the coaching, the college coaching field during this time when COVID-19 affected college sports? Uh, especially tennis with teams being cut and not many positions being open. So basically a question to all the panelists. I'll start with you, Jim. Any advice on uh, individuals who'd like to try to break into the coaching profession? Well, it is trickier, I think, now that we're all isolated and not, you know, most of the tennis clubs and the, and the tennis teams are shut down. But I think just the classic things, uh, play as much tennis as you can, participate on a team if you can, uh, and then try to get in with a, uh, some coaches that you know that are good, even as a, a volunteer coach or an assistant coach. It's amazing how many of the top coaches in the country have gone through mentorships where they spent time with other coaches as an assistant coach, or even a volunteer coach. So as much tennis as you can get, as much competition as you can yourself and playing on teams and hanging around teams. Thank you. Same question, Raquel because um, you've had experiences coaching. How did you get your start and what was it relationship built or you just sent out a bunch of resumes years ago? I mean, you're not that old, but I'm, I'm just curious um, what advice you'd give on, the, on that same question. I th <laughs> well, I think my experience is a little different than most. Um, I actually, out of school, whenever I was about to graduate, I was applying to be a graduate assistant. Uh, and I was wanting to go to uh, get a, my master's and I was applying for a bunch of positions and I went to an interview and they just uh, decided to, uh, they fired the head coach that was before uh, for that year and they no longer had the graduate assistant position. And they interviewed me and they asked me if I was ready to be a head coach and if I wanted that position and I, I said yes, and I didn't know if I was ready. I was just about to graduate, and that's kind of what happened to me. I, I was very lucky, I would say. I don't think my story is very common, but that's kind of what happened to me. So I started as a head coach whenever uh, I, I graduated. So I graduated in 2012, and my first season was 12 and 13. Um, so, so that, that was a little unique. Uh, so I kind of had to learn from my former coach, a lot of things and, and it was tough. Uh, it was a unique situation, but I think, uh, you know, starting as a volunteer, uh, you know, assistant, uh, being an assistant before, I think it's probably the, the way to go. And, I mean, we, we have great things going now that everybody's doing podcasts. The ITA is having a podcast, which I think is awesome. And so I think it's starting with that and kind of getting familiar with the, the, with the field. I, I mean, I love coaching. I think it's, it's great for people that are trying to get involved. But yeah, it's, it's a difficult time, but I, I wouldn't be discouraged. I think it's, there, there are still positions available, so. Great. Thank you, Raquel, great answer. Todd, same question coaching profession, how do you break in? And then we'll get off the subject. Uh, yeah, this is an easy one for me. Actually, I'll steal the answer from one of my good friends, uh, Ryan Keckley. He's the coach at USD in, in California. And uh, we were just talking about this, how incredibly hard it is to break into our industry now. And uh, his words were, it's about relationships. And, you know, I, I know I referenced that when I was talking about recruiting, but um, it's about building those relationships. So you know, if you have an opportunity to go work some camps over the summer, now I know that this summer doesn't look like that's a great opportunity, but if you can go work some camps underneath some of the greater coaches that have, you know, that have been around for years, I think that's one great thing. And, um, you know, I think 
Dr. Love brought up the, the fact of being a volunteer. Um, you know, if, if you can find a way to maybe get a teaching position, I, I'll only speak for Northeastern Ohio, but man, there is a high demand for teaching pros and it just seems like really hard to find them. And it's just hard. It's hard to find a 22 or a 23 year old who, who just graduated college who's willing to work a Friday night or a Saturday night and do a kid's clinic or a adult clinic or whatever it is who might be able to pay their rent and work their way through, uh, you know, teaching tennis in order to help out with the team in that city or, or town that, that it's in. So, you know, that's, a, that's kind of what I look for is someone who could teach a little bit on the side and want to be a volunteer and get exposure with the top, you know, nationally ranked program. But um, like I said, it's, it's crazy how the supply just seems so, so small from my lens. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there are a couple, I think, really relevant questions, and it actually brings us back to recruiting. Um, one from Jeff Newman, uh, and then a follow-up uh, in terms of the class of 2021 recruits. Um, you kind of, I'll, I'll ask Tyler this question, and then on, on to Coach Mark. Uh, what advice can you give to incoming freshmen, especially in a case where several seniors will be staying on for fifth year, and then kind of that, Lisa Kopfer question at the bottom for class of 221 recruits how many fewer spots are out there due to kids sticking out an extra year is there any data that you know of um, Tyler and you know in terms of spots uh, like Dr. Jim said he's got a no cut program so that may not be relevant for for his junior college program but uh, what are your thoughts there um for us i i mean if you if you have seniors staying there i think a big thing if you can get out on the court um if it's allowed in your community um to really get out there and start trying to make sure you're coming in in good shape and even if you can't get on the court make sure you're doing physical exercises and that way you're ready to go um because definitely in the fall for a lot of them just kind of get them ready for the spring so that way they're hopefully going to crack into the lineup as a freshman and they're not in there, but they're going to have to compete against a senior. So it's going to be definitely tougher. And I think for the class of 2021, I think you got to start sending emails and reaching out to coaches of universities that you're interested in um, because there's probably, there may be less scholarship money out there um, and just kind of depends on that. That would be my big thing is start reaching out now. You can't ever, it can't be too early. No, that's great advice. Great advice. Mark, what's your, your sense on, uh, on that team where there's a lot of seniors, fifth year players, then you have freshmen coming in and what is the landscape for, for 2021? Yeah. Just from my own uh, experiences and then talking to other coaches in the area. Uh, I think that originally when that, was offered that you could stay this extra year, the emotion of losing your season or losing that extra year, everyone was like, yes, I want to come back. I want to come back. But now that it's starting to have a little bit of time, I'm hearing other coaches I'm talking to are hearing that, you know, they're starting to sit back and say, oh, wait, that means I have to pay for another year of, you know, being, paying for my apartment at school, paying for food, being away from home. Uh, so most of them, the option, it, it's not, what they were thinking it was going to be, they got excited because they were given this extra year and it was, they were sad that they lost, you know, the season they were in. Uh, but when it came down to it, you know, the finances come into it. And uh, so I'm not really seeing as much. So I, I would say, don't let that deter a player from being afraid uh, that there might not be a spot, uh, you know, just be aggressive. Uh, be truthful to the coaches you're talking to and, and just, and, you know, maybe say your concern and see where they're at. But, uh, but I, I don't think that they should, you know, focus too much on, on that personally. You know, since a lot of the questions, thank you, Mark, since a lot of the questions are focused on kind of this squad size and opportunity and money's available, maybe each of you could just speak briefly to the size of your squad, how many players you like to keep on your team, um, to give the, the viewers a sense of, you know, capacity. 
Go ahead, Mark, and then we'll we'll yeah. snake back. Yeah, I usually carry well. I usually carry around eight or nine on my men's team. Uh, I would like to carry more, but uh, a lot of pub public schools are uh, are limited due to Title IX reasons. Um, so I'm, you know, I carry about eight or nine uh, on the men's side, and usually 10, 10 to twelve on the women's side. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah, I'm the uh, for the women's team, uh, we're carrying 10 to 12 players. Um, that's where I'd like to keep it at and be right around there. But if we have to go over the 12 players and there's a player that really wants to come to the university and I think will help the team, definitely not going to turn away that player. Nice. Thank you. Todd, same question. Yeah, so I think anybody that's been watching the the Last Dance Jordan documentary on ESPN um, could take note that, you know, Jordan treated the practices as if they were real games and he was really intense. So, you know, my philosophy is that we carry enough to have two teams. So that would be 12. Um, and that'd be six versus six. And I tell any recruit that, look, we're going to scrimmage ourselves and that needs to feel exactly as if it were a dual match as if it wasn't. And so if you're someone that's maybe, you know, just to touch on the last question that's coming in and there's a senior coming back and maybe you thought that that was your starting position, well, you're still going to be playing 20 some matches during the off season when, when the team is playing against each other. And um, I think as long as you have a good culture and you have, you have players that are totally bought in those inner squad scrimmages can um, can really make every pull the level of the team up. Um, and it gets more people involved with tennis. And, th and that's at the end of the day, the greatest thing. I mean, let's get as many people involved with this sport and playing this sport as we can. Thank you, Kat, coach. Awesome. Raquel. Yes, we carry between eight and 12 with the guys and the girls in our teams. And it's like Todd said, we like to do a lot of challenge matches here. So even numbers for us is the better, the best. Um, so we try to do eight to 12, uh, but it's, it's, it's like Tyler said, if we see somebody that's really good and we already have more than 12, uh, we're, we're looking to, to add that, but usually between eight and 12 for the past five years I've been here. So nice. I'm going to throw you a curveball, Raquel, just because, uh, I'm interested in your response to this question. Sure. So you're, you coach the men and the women. So I think there's probably a lot of people that see you as a role model and kind of a new frontier. Uh, what's that like for you and is it a badge of honor or is it uh, something that you uh, challenge yourself every day? Obviously you have successful teams so um, I think it's really cool and you're kind of opening opportunities and providing uh, you know that uh, path for future women to also coach men the same way men coach women. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, this is actually my fourth year coaching men. So I started with the women and I, my first uh, job with the men was division two. Um, so I'm super excited to coach men. I'm actually the first women to coach men in our school. Uh, so I'm really proud of that. Um, it's a challenge, it, uh, especially in the beginning was the transition because it's different uh, how you do coach women and you coach men it's a completely different it's a different approach it's a different relationship for sure and it's it's something that's newer for me it's my fourth year it's if you ask me uh, what's what's the easiest probably to coach the women because it's uh, you know I'm a woman so uh, it's easy to to relate sometimes but it's a nice challenge uh, my guys have been very fortunate with my guys my guys have been extremely open to to me coaching uh, them and and so it's it's been it's been great it's been it's been a nice thing for for us and I hope you know women continue to to try to be uh, in sport uh, I hope that I inspired a little bit of uh, women to, to stick to, to coaching. It's not an easy job, uh, but it's the job that I, I hope to see more women doing. So Nice. Thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, I'm going to move on to Coach Jim. Uh, really talk about life as a student athlete uh, at your school um, and what a, what, what's a typical week like um, 
at, at your school, Jim, uh, as a JUCO student? Well, we try to have the emphasis that, that academics come first, and so therefore I'm one of those coaches that if a player has to study or has a, a test or something, they, they, I would allow them to miss practice, uh, but they obviously have to be there for our matches. We practice uh, basically Monday through Friday during the season uh, from basically one to three. We don't have our own courts right now, so we have to use a, a local high school, so we go a little earlier in the winter. We practice three days a week, uh, basically from 1.30 to 3 at an indoor club. Uh, we do have some matches on Saturdays, but basically we ask the kids to make commitments uh, Monday through Friday from about 1 to 3. They've got to do a little transportation there. In the winter, we practice three days a week, and we have a few matches on Fridays and Saturdays, but most of them are during the week. So that's the schedule for our players. They play fall and spring outdoors. The men and women, even if they don't have a competitive season, the men practice with the women in the fall during their off season and the women practice in the spring when the men play. So there it's a three quarters year uh, commitment for them. Wow. That's great. Thank you. Raquel, what does it look like uh, at Lake Forest? Yes. So we practice every day. Uh, we have a practice block. So from four to seven hours, student athletes practice. So we don't have any classes around that time. So we're very fortunate about that. Uh, I know sometimes can be a struggle to uh, schedule classes around practice, and so we're fortunate about that. So I practice with my, with both of my teams from four to seven. I have usually the women coming first, so we practice between an hour and a half and two hours, so, so it kind of overlaps uh, some practices. Um, we have four courts on campus. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, with the course that we have there. Um, and then in the, in, the, in the spring season, we go inside and we have a facility that works with us that's about 10 minutes away from campus. It's the Racquet Club of Lake Bluff. Um, and so it's a great facility. Uh, school provides transportation for our student athletes to be there. Uh, they also have the opportunity in the off season to play there. Uh, they have a college membership that they can walk in and the courts. Um, so that's kind of how it works for us. Nice. Nice. Tyler. Um, sorry, I got kicked off. Um, but yeah, for us, we have eight courts uh, on camp on campus and we practice um, later in the after or in the evening after the men's team, uh, usually for two an hour and a half to two hours and then twice a week we're doing strength and conditioning as well we have a just got a brand new state-of-the-art um weight lifting area for athletes and we have our own strength and conditioning coach so it's kind of really nice um as far as indoor courts we go over to uh westview healthplex which is five minutes away and we pay for everybody's memberships there and it's free to walk on and then we also practice there in January and February. Thank you, Tyler. Glad you're back on. Uh, same question. Uh, Todd, maybe I went out of order. I probably screwed up Tyler's uh, mojo. I'll go to Todd. What's a typical week like at Case Western uh, Party School of the Midwest? Um, yeah, so we start we start on uh, Monday's usually an off day because you're playing over the weekend. So, you know, we go at 7 a.m. And I, it sounds like most of the coaches have mentioned that they, they go in the afternoon, but um, we choose to go in the morning and that way uh, they can get their tennis out of the way. And then they just go to school the whole day. Now, if they have an 8:30 class that they have to go to, um, then that is what it is. They just leave early and they go to class and maybe they can come back later to hit. Um, but uh, it allows opportunity for them to get ahead on their schoolwork. And if they do get ahead and they're, you know, feel good about where they are, they can just come back to the course later in the afternoon and get a second hit in. Um, and then, you know, we share uh, an indoor and outdoor facility with our women. Our women a lot of times are, are there at the same time as the men. We do do some mixed doubles stuff. And, you know, we, we, uh, we have a fun thing that we do with that. Um, so they'll, they'll go through Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, kind of rigorous, but then on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we'll use the afternoons to be able to get match playing just so that, and that's usually when we do our scrimmages so that we don't have anything pressing, like we have to get to class or something like that. Awesome. Thanks, Todd. Mark, what's, your, what's a typical week during season look like for you? Oh, 
Oh, he's muted. Yeah, I can't unmute him. <laughs> there we go. There you go. Uh, I was just saying that similar to pretty much everybody else, um, you know, we practice Monday through Friday during the season, usually playing on the weekend. So yeah, we have a lot of Mondays off. Uh, if we're not playing on the weekend, usually we'll at least have one of the two weekend days to, uh, you know, play some type of match uh, with each other. Uh, then we, we're, in, we're in the weight room two days a week. And then also uh, we have mandatory study hours. Uh, so, you know, you do have to add that into your week too. Um, based on your GPA that you set, you might have a certain amount of study hours, but we we'll spend a lot of time focusing on that. We are very lucky that we have our own indoor tennis facility on campus. Uh, so that helps. Uh, it's pretty much the hangout for, we have a study room inside there. Uh, my office is there. And so it, it makes it a little nicer. So we have four indoor courts and 10 outdoor courts on campus. Um, and so we really don't have to fight for courts as much. So it, it's nice. Well, you guys all kind of answered the facilities question uh, in, that, in that question stream there. Um, we're getting close to, I think, uh, towards the, well, we're getting towards the end of the webinar. Um, I'd like to finish with a couple kind of more philosophical questions um, and reality questions. The first is the, the reality question. I'll start with Mark. What have you heard from your school's administration as it relates to the upcoming fall season and the upcoming academic year? Uh, yeah, as for the academic year, our school has come out and said that they do plan on having in-person classes. Uh, so we're, we're going as normal for that. Uh, what it'll look like, they still haven't really come down to that yet, but I'm not sure they know. Uh, as far as the season goes, we're, we're still up in the air. We really don't know. I, I wish that we could, uh, you know, give our players a, a better answer, but uh, we're still preparing as if, you know, it was going to be normal, but, you know, we'll see. Sounds good. Thank you, Mark. Uh, let's see, Tyler and then Todd. Yeah, we just actually yesterday we just had a uh, town hall meeting with our uh, president of the university, and I mean he seems pretty fired up that hopefully we'll be in person classes um, on campus, um, and kind of for the fall season we're kind of waiting for the NAI to put something out, and they're looking to you know beginning of July that they're going to put something out that what what they're kind of wanting and looking for in the fall. Um, so then we'll just kind of plan from there and then let our student athletes know. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah, so, um, you know, what we've heard is that, you know, we do have a lot of international students is that we're going to have a dual delivery. We're, we're going to be back in person. That's the plan. And we're also going to have a virtual offering. So just kind of how we had to go virtual towards the end of the spring semester we will be offering that option for those coming from other parts of the world um, that can't get back. As far as um, hearing about the fall competitions and things like that, I mean, I have heard a lot about conferences and, and what they're doing with their fall sports um, as far as limiting it to conference play and no out of region travel, things like that. Um, so I get the sense that maybe that's more towards where we're, we're headed. Um, but then again, it's a moving target. And I think everybody is just kind of trying to wait and, and kind of see how the testing comes out and, and how um, you know, vaccines are developed. Thank you, Todd. Raquel? Yes, we so for us it's the same. We are planning to to have school in the fall in person class. So our president just actually sent a, a statement out that we're going that's the the plan we have. We have a committee on campus that you know talks about how you know it's going to it's how it's going to be if we decide to have a, a classes. And I think it's the upcoming weekends it's going to be, you know, we we're going to I guess as, as, as we progress with through the summer, I think we're gonna have more news. So I, I think in July, we'll have a better idea what's gonna happen, but the plan for Lake Forest is just to be open in the fall. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Dr. Jim? We just had a meeting with our coaches this week and right now we're scheduled to be able to practice on August 1st. And the college is offering three sessions of summer school, one that'll be totally remote, 
one that'll be alternative. And then they are planning a summer school session that'll be face to face. So we're still optimistic. But I think what the athletic director said is that a lot of it's going to depend upon group decisions, what the National Junior College Association says or the conferences. He said, we do need to be prepared that that starting date might be pushed back or there's a possibility that they would cancel the season. But as of now, we're still planning to go in the fall and start on August 1st. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Uh, and then why don't you bring it back uh, in closing, uh, what do you see for the future of college tennis? Kind of a, kind of a broad topic, but uh, you know, just from your perspective, what you're saying. Well, I think our athletic director expressed maybe what a lot of us are thinking. He, he said he was a little worried that when the spring rolled around and we had the COVID virus, athletics was not considered an essential part of the school. And he says one of our goals is we've got to begin to convince people that it is. Uh, so I think he is a little concerned about budget and things like that. Right now, our administration seems pretty committed to athletics. But if budgets get cut a lot, I think uh, then we have to be a little wary. Yeah, thank you. Honest answer. Thank you. Raquel? You know, that's a good point. I, I am optimistic, I guess. I like to think about as, as positive as I possibly can, especially during this time. Uh, I mean, the future of college tennis. I, I mean, I think the future, I want to say the future is bright. I think, you know, as we obviously, we still bring enrollment. Athletics is still bring enrollment to the school. I mean, Division Three, they, they need us. They need us coaches to, a lot of kids come to play tennis and a lot of kids come to play basketball and whatnot. So I think, um, they, they need us to be to be playing. Uh, so I'm really hoping that administrators are gonna start thinking that way as well. That's so my you're hopeful, I love that. Tara mixed up the squares, so my rhythm, <laughs> my, my snake got messed up. I, I didn't, hope I didn't surprise you, Raquel. Tyler, and then we'll go Ty, Todd and then Mark to, to wrap up. Um, I think the big thing for the like college landscape for the NAI is um, just being able to continue uh, getting out there and playing tennis. And then um, from there, I would say um, the athletes and the school uh, or like the, the learning and everything just makes it a, a well-rounded candidate after college because you're only going to be in college for four years. But this is a good selling point that you're able to you know, time management, you're able to juggle athletics and um, academics. So that's the big selling point for Marion is what can we help you do after Marion? So that's kind of where we're at. Thank you, Tyler. Todd, uh, future college tennis. Yeah, so uh, what I was sort of afraid of happening happened. So that's why I'm on my cell phone now. I don't know if Tara can unmute me. Can you hear me, Tim? Yep, you're good. Okay, so, um, yeah, it's a tough question. I mean, I, I was talking to uh, our president, uh, Paul Farah, before this, and, um, you know, our our sense was, you know, things are going to start looking like they did before maybe a little bit, where um, people, sports were played more regionally. Uh, everything was kind of based around your conference. You played um, – you know, everybody that was kind of around you and then, you you know, in the hopes of make it to a national championship, et cetera. Um, maybe we're headed back that way. I'm trying to look at everything so positive, right? If, if things this year get limited to conference play and more regional play and, and, and schools are able to save some money, you know, I guess that's, that's good in the hopes that in the future, when we move forward, and things come back to normal, then we'll be ready to be right back where we were with keeping up with all the Joneses of, you know, being able to travel across the country and, and do more play. But um, I guess for now, I could see this becoming very realistically a regional, um, traveling more locally type of thing. Um, and I guess, you know, selfishly, hopefully that offers more opportunity for our program to play more programs that are in this zoom call you know play more d2 schools play more nai schools um so that we can get good competition you know more close to our backyard All right, great answer thank you todd mark yeah no i mean i'm optimistic uh i am nervous when you 
you know, you see the schools that are cutting programs. Unfortunately, tennis is usually on that list. And uh, my only advice would be to those that are listening and to the coaches is to, when you do play on your college team, be seen, be a part of the campus, be a part of the community, uh, be a part of everything. Because the more that uh, they see the tennis teams and the tennis coaches being involved, hopefully that uh, makes it harder uh, for when it comes to that decision. Uh, but, but overall, I, I, you know, like, like Todd was saying, I can see it becoming more regionally. And what makes me nervous is that, you know, they're already looking at cutting dates. Uh, I hope that that doesn't become the norm. I hope that uh, we continue to be an advocate for if we do have to limit kind of what's going on now that we look to uh, stay p positive and, and, and look to open it up more in the future, not be willing to just take this cut and uh, go from it. But, uh, but overall, I, I mean, I, I see it as a positive that, you know, there's so much love out there for tennis that it can continue to grow and get better. But uh, we have to be the advocates for it. Awesome. I totally agree. I appreciate everybody's candid responses to that. Um, we're near the end of time. We're probably past the end of time, but I want to be, there are a couple of really good questions that I think uh, we can just close with so that we could, we were able to answer all the questions that came in. Uh, one quick question and I'll, I'll start with Mark. High school coach here, curious everyone's opinion on multi-sport athletes. I have a few soccer tennis players who hope to play college tennis. Their tennis game definitely suffers by not playing year round. Any thoughts? Oh, I, I love multi-sports athletes. Uh, it's one of the first questions I ask. Uh, I, I just think that ability to cross train and to have different abilities and understanding of you know, team sports versus individual sports, different coordination levels. I, I think it's a, it's a huge bonus. Um, it, you know, I understand that some people do benefit from, you know, specializing in one, but I, I, I'm not sure that it uh, is going to help you in the long run. So. Thank you, Mark. Todd, you want to speak to that? And then I'll, I'll ask uh, Raquel to speak to um, um, this question from Holly and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, huge. I, I, I can only echo those statements. Um, it's a team sport and as much, as much as I'd like to, you know, encourage that it is a team sport, these are going to be your best friends. I mean, personally, I had a wonderful experience. All my teammates at Ohio State are all my best friends. We were in each other's weddings. Um, you know, we're life, lifetime best friends and, um, it's a team thing. So if you can get a student athlete that has experienced being part of a team and knows how to interact with a team uh, by playing other sports, man, home run for me. Awesome. Thank you. Raquel, do the coaches like kids who are all tennis all the time want to eat, breathe, sleep tennis, or do they like well-rounded kids? I like all around kids for sure. I mean, I love, I mean, trust me, I love tennis, but I like, whenever people can talk something else other than tennis too. I don't think just talking about tennis all the time is, is the, the greatest thing in the world. But yes, I, I think it needs to be like, you need to be able to talk to about other things for sure. Thank you, Raquel. And then just in closing, I, I wanna be uh, fair to Frank Chen. Uh, he's got a very uh, specific question about uh, coaches recruiting players from Taiwan. And I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer that offline um, uh, or I'm just checking the time here. We're already after five o'clock. So uh, it has to do with very specific um, questions. So Frank, we'll, we'll, we'll grab that question and we'll, we'll get back to you on that. Um, I want to, I want to say thank you to all of the panelists. You guys were super generous with your comments and uh, your frankness, um, insightful, you know, just really honest. So that I also want to thank everyone for listening in. You know, this wouldn't happen without Chad Doctor, who sits on the sideline on this screen, but making sure. Uh, we're, we're following the proper protocol. And then really the, the magician behind all of this is Tara uh, that you can't see, but uh, she's the marketing director for the Midwest section. 
She's the one that gets all the social media out there about this webinar, about the webinar and about all Midwest section um, programming. Uh, life as tennis players in the Midwest. So thank you to Tara. Um, in closing, I, I would say that uh, our series continues next Friday, where we will be featuring a distinguished panel, uh, including Dr. Brian Hainline, Chief Medical Officer for the NCAA, uh, Dr. Niru Jayanthi, Jayanthi uh, Director of Emory's Sports Medicine Research and Education, as well as Dr. Liz Bondi, uh, former D3 tennis and basketball All-American from DePauw down in Greencastle. Um, and she's a current podiatrist. Uh, and we'll be looking at the health and wellness of the student athletes as we venture into the summer and into life um, in the fall under, this, under the current conditions. Um, ways to train safely, how to live safely, and how to navigate during a pandemic. So. Uh, thank you, everybody. Wish everybody uh, a wonderful weekend, safe, safe days ahead, and uh, we'll get we'll get through this. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, Tim. Thank, thank you. you.